You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. I have Hannah Crum. She's known as the Kombucha Mama, and she's also an author. Uh, her website is kombuchacamp.com, and we have two Ks in there, K for kombucha and K for camp. So, Hannah, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me, Richard. Yeah, tell me, uh, I'm sure that people have uh, you know, seen kombucha in the store and probably tried it. And uh, but tell, How did you get involved with kombucha? How did you become I call- the kombucha mama? Well, I call it kombucha kismet because I feel like kombucha found me. I was visiting a friend uh, from college. He'd moved to San Francisco. And when we got a tour of his apartment, lo and behold, he was brewing kombucha. I'd never heard of it. I didn't try it at the time. But when I returned to Los Angeles, it was in all of the Whole Foods. And so I tried a bottle. And for me, it was instant affinity. Um, a lot of people make like sort of a sour face or find the flavor a little intense or unpalatable, but I was the girl who used to sneak pickle juice out of the pickle jar. So for me, it really resonated. And at the time I wasn't really eating a wonderful diet. I was still sad, standard American diet with a lot of processed foods. So having a food that had living organisms, enzymes, and just made me feel alive was, was a transformation. That's great. Yeah. My, uh, my wife made kombucha like once or twice and she's kind of scared of the scoby you know the creature that forms on top of it she was like you know she was unsure whether to drink it or not she tried it and it was good but she was like freaked out by the scoby on it you know yeah a lot of people are because they're just unfamiliar with it right um you know Back in the olden days, people would make vinegar and all kinds of things. And in fact, our culture is very similar to a vinegar plant or vinegar mother. They both are derived from acetobacter. Uh, Kombucha often has glucon acetobacter, which is an important distinction because it also creates these other acids that um, support a healthy liver, such as gluconic and glucuronic acid. Um, Mm. And so it, I think it's, we're just, we're not familiar and we're afraid. And we, there's a lot of fear around kombucha, I think, because it isn't something that's been around um, in the mainstream for so long. But as you right. know, that's our whole purpose is to help people get familiar with it and to understand that it means you no harm. It's here to provide a world of good. Yeah. So how do you explain uh, kombucha to someone that, you know, maybe has seen it, maybe tasted it, but they want to know more, like either brew their own or just learn more about it. What are the, what are some of like the big initial facts you'll tell them about it? Sure. Well, the first thing we start with is it's fermented tea. So you're starting with one of the healthiest plants on the planet, one of the most popular beverages in the world, tea. We're then adding sugar to it to provide some nutrients for the organisms. And then we float that SCOBY in there. Um, it, takes a little bit of time, but it converts it into these healthy acids. And the cool thing, as you mentioned, is that it reproduces. And so it's literally a a lifetime supply once you have one culture. It's really difficult to contaminate as much as people may have heard horror stories here and there. It's a food just like any other. So how do we know a food is not appropriate to consume? It gets mold. What does mold look like? Well, (laughs) like any other type of food mold you've ever seen. And so... Hmm. Uh, again, it's it's what do you do with moldy food? Typically, you just throw it away. The same is true with kombucha. And the nice thing is because they reproduce, you can keep extras on hand for just in case 
and start all over with a fresh culture. So, all right. So the question is, if kombucha is good or bad and you're, you know, if it's sitting there on top of your fridge or in your fridge and you look at it, you know, what are some ways to know if it's safe to drink or not? And are they um, obvious? Yeah, it's just mold. And how do you know it's mold? Because sometimes the culture for formation will look weird to the untrained eye. You touch it with your finger. And if it leaves a powdery residue, then there's mold. So mold can never get oh. into the liquid. It's only ever on the surface of the culture. So it's really easy to spot and identify. And of course, if you're ever worried or not certain, take a photo, send it to customer service at kombuchacamp.com. Our team is happy to help you figure that out. We also have a really great mold gallery on our website. And of course, our book, the <laughs> Big Book of Kombucha has a whole bunch of pictures of mold, too. The mold gallery. That's funny. Well, it's <laughs> useful, though. I mean, if you're do, – do the – is it hard to tell even, you know, to the trained or untrained eye? Is it hard to tell if the kombucha is good or not? It's really straightforward. Yeah. I mean, it's just like okay. how do you know if a piece of cheese is moldy? I mean, it's got blue penicillin-like stuff growing on it. So it's the same type yeah, of thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. No, it's it's so, super simple. This is the like funny thing about it is actually kombucha is really simple, but because we're unfamiliar and we're not used to it, it we sort of make all these elaborate, um, you know, we just get worried about it. But the reality is it's super simple and basic. So what's the process of making kombucha? Like, you know, okay, I want to make it. What do I do? Huh? You know, like, what would you tell me? Sure. Well, you probably already have the ingredients and most of the supplies in your home right now. Tea, sugar a tightly woven cloth cover, a jar of some sort, um, or a larger container if you're doing continuous brew. Uh, the thing you might most likely don't have is the SCOBY, and that's where we can help. Uh, we are bacteria farmers, and so we can uh, get you set up with your own culture. You might also get one from a friend if they're making it. Now, some people will try to grow one from a bottle of kombucha, and the problem with that is um, the way that kombucha is processed, sometimes it removes some of the elements of the kombucha. And so while that's an excellent test to know if the brand you're purchasing is a raw living product, many people have reported and our own experiments confirm that after a few batches, the flavor just isn't there. And so it's a small investment for a lifetime supply grab a healthy culture and uh, you won't regret it. But once you mm. add the culture to the sweet tea, so let's say we're doing a gallon batch, we cover it up with that cloth cover. It does need oxygen. We want to avoid cheesecloth because the weave is too loose and fruit flies, also known as vinegar flies, will wiggle their way in. Nobody likes to open up their jar and see a bunch of grains of rice, which are actually fruit fly larvae squirming all over their brew. So oh. um, <laughs> Stick with that tightly woven cloth, but don't use a lid because it does need oxygen. Uh, typically, it takes 7 to 14 days, and that just depends on how warm or cool your space is. And it also depends on how sweet or tart you like the kombucha. So uh, we have an ideal temperature range of 75 to 85 Fahrenheit with um, 80 sort of being our sweet spot. Uh, and then... If we have that temperature, again, the longer it ferments, the more the sugar is converted into the acids, the more tangy it becomes. And so some people might start out on the sweeter side, but the reality is the body actually craves sour and bitter because those are the flavors of health and digestion. Again, not like every day, not like every single meal or something like that, but um, they actually help support a healthy body. And so uh, oftentimes you'll find the more, the longer you go drinking it, the more tangy you enjoy it. Okay, so seven to fourteen days. What? Um, how do you know the kombucha is ready? You, Taste. You like starting at day seven, you start tasting it. Yeah, exactly right. So you can slip a straw in there and taste it. Some people are like, oh, what about the backwash? The reality is the pH of the kombucha is so low that it prevents contamination. This is why it's one of the safest foods to make at home. In fact, all of the fermented foods, if we remember, were developed thousands of years ago because we didn't have refrigeration. And so the mm. microbes create acids that uh, create an inhospitable environment to mold and things like that. So really it's only vulnerable to mold at the very beginning of the process before it's been able to acidify completely. And that's why we don't just want the SCOBY. We also need some starter liquid. So starter liquid is simply fermented kombucha tea. So it's already fermented. You throw it in there, and that helps to drop the pH quickly and prevent mold from growing in the first place. But if we don't have a warm enough temperature and it doesn't acidify quickly enough, that's where we can also sometimes see more mold in the winter and times like that if we're not keeping it in that ideal temperature range. 
Oh, so just like all bacteria, the warmer it is to a certain extent, the faster the acidification will happen. Yeah, actually, it's the yeast that are temperature sensitive. So if you've ever baked bread or used commercial yeast, it says to use lukewarm water. And that's because, um, well, humans are related to yeast, but no, they just like that more uh, temperate temperature. The bacteria actually can withstand a bit more extreme temperatures, but we... We're a symbiosis, so we also need to be conscientious of the yeast. And so the warmer it is, the faster it will ferment because the yeasts are at a higher temperature. Oh, well, what's the temperature range for kombuchas? Like, what's the sweet spot? 80 degrees Fahrenheit is our sweet spot. Um, It can withstand up to 108 degrees uh, for a short period of time, but anything hotter than that and for a long time is likely going to cause the organisms to start to die off. So again, that 75 to 85 with 80 being our sweet spot. All right. So if you're tasting it, what will it taste like if it's not ready? And what will it taste like if it's ready? And then what will it taste like if it's over ready? (laughs) Great question. Uh, So what it'll taste like if it's not quite ready enough is a little too sweet. If you taste it early enough in the process, you'll be like, oh, it's sort of watery. I'm not really getting a a full flavor. And that's because not enough of it has been um, converted through that fermentation process. When it's just right, it's going to have a sweet, sour balance. So you might taste it initially and it's got some tang, but then you also have that residual sweetness coming up on the back end. So it's pleasantly that way, sort of like a delicious Sour Patch Kid, but um, not with all the extra sugar added. If it's too fermented, it's just going to be sour. It's going to have a real pungent vinegar-like flavor to it. Now, that doesn't mean it's bad or spoiled or ruined. It just means we don't like the flavor. And so that's sort of the interesting thing about kombucha is it never technically goes bad. Um, We just might not enjoy the flavor. But if it is over-fermented, what we do is we can add some water, dilute it, it drops the pH a little bit, sort of like adding an ice cube to a glass of scotch where it's just going to shift the flavor profile, open it up a little bit. You could also add juice or even a little bit of sugar like you would to iced tea um, to sweeten it up in the moment. But if you don't want to do that, there's also loads of uses for kombucha vinegar, salad dressing, marinade, hair tonic, facial toner. And even if you decide to pour it down the drain, hey, guess what clears out drains? acid. So just like it's clearing out your pipes inside, it can also help clear out the pipes in your sink as well. So we think of kombucha as sort of a snout to tail. Nothing ever goes to waste from it. That's cool. Interesting. What about, I mean, in the store, I see there's all these flavors. Can you add flavor whenever you want, or it has to be done at the beginning? Like, you know, how does that work? Yeah, so flavoring is really fun. Um, Back in the 80s, I think everybody drank it as this really sour vinegar juice and didn't add (laughs) many flavors. But as it became a commercial product, uh, people started infusing flavor into it. And so typically we're going to flavor in what we call the secondary phase. So our primary fermentation is the tea sugar SCOBY. Once it has that sort of sweet, sour balance we enjoy, now we're going to add some you know, fresh fruit pieces or herbs or ginger, whatever it is that you like. And of course, there's so many formats. Um, so you could have juice, you could have puree, you could have pieces of fruit. Um, so there's lots of variety. And our book has 260 flavor inspirations. So if you're just not sure where to begin, we give you lots of ideas. And of course, there's some flavoring suggestions on our blog as well. Um, But in that secondary phase, we infuse it with those flavors. And then how long we leave that in just sort of depends on your fermentation process. So for most people, they're going to infuse it with the flavoring, leave it at room temperature for a couple of days, and then put it into the refrigerator and start drinking it. Um, Our process is a little bit different in that we harvest it when it's still a little sweeter. We then flavor for two to three days. We strain that out, put it into bottles, and then let it bottle age at sort of a cooler temperature, but not the fridge, somewhere between 65 and 75 degrees for a couple of weeks to allow an additional third fermentation process to occur. Um, It dries up nicely in the bottle. It's not as sour and uh, really extracts a lot of great flavor and nutrients nutrition that way. And that process is described in our book. But most people can't wait to drink their kombuchas and they don't have the patience for it. We've uh, we've been doing this a long time and have built up a supply where that timing really works for us. Well, it sounds like, I don't know, can you use different teas, different amounts of sugar, different sugar blends, uh, different other ancillary things like different fruits? I mean, it seems like you can modulate this thing thousands of different ways, right? 
it's flexible technology, as we say, sort of once you learn the parameters of having a healthy culture and what that looks like, you really can do the sky's the limit. I mean, we're seeing kombucha that's made with coffee instead of tea or yerba mate and other things like that in primary as opposed to a flavoring. Uh, you also have people making kombucha with uh, maple syrup and other types of sweeteners. Now, of course, switching those elements up is going to change the flavor profile as well as the fermentation time. And our book sort of dives into more of the ways you can do that. But yeah, you literally, uh, you can play with it so many different ways. And the fun thing is, is because it reproduces um, with every batch, you have plenty of extra cultures that you can set up experiments. And also because it's a vinegar, it's going to extract whatever um, nutritional elements it can from what you're infusing into it. So if you're familiar with herbs for specific ailments, you can put that right into your booch and now you're getting uh, those benefits as well. And with kombucha, less is more, right? So some people are like, oh, I want to put a whole bunch of juice in here. Well, you'll end up making it more sour and causing bottle bombs, which is something you want to be conscientious of. Um, Basically, what happens is that the yeast start re-fermenting whatever sort of sugar source you're putting back into the bottle. And when you're in a tightly closed bottle, that's what helps to hold the fizz. I think the thing to remember is like with sodas and things you buy at the store, they're forcing air into the liquid. And that liquid's going to, those bubbles are going to stay there regardless of temperature. With kombucha, because the effervescence is coming from the organisms, from the yeast, sometimes when we put it in the fridge, the fizz will minimize. And sometimes if we leave it out too long, and especially in the summer, it could get too hot. And if there's no way for that gas to release, it can potentially explode. So we always advise, especially in the summer, keeping bottles in some sort of cooler or box if you don't have enough room in the fridge in order to minimize the impact of that should that happen. And then you'll also see people with geysers where they like spray their ceiling with a bunch of fruit and make a pretty new ceiling for themselves um, or all over their clothes. And so we do also recommend Great. opening with caution over the over the sink in order to prevent uh, redecorating your whole home. Have you um, seen that, um, let's say, a naturopath or, a, you know, a, a, I don't know, certain doctors have decided to use kombucha as a medium for, you know, a vast amount of nutrition or, you know, herb therapies? Have you seen anyone do that? Well, I mean, I think that what's great about um, naturopaths is they're more likely to offer that as a solution for folks who may be struggling with digestive issues or with um, heartburn. You know, my husband, he struggled with heartburn and was on medication for it. And once he started drinking kombucha on a regular basis, within two weeks, he he never needed to go back to his medication. Um, so it's really excellent to see that people are waking up to the fact that this can be something um, that goes to a root cause. Uh, and instead of necessarily, you know, needing pills to do all the work to manage symptoms, uh, it can help alleviate the root cause. Well, you know, I've heard this with yogurt, um, you know, because they want to make profit. Uh, the yogurts that you'll buy in a store are, you know, they have just enough bacteria to be called yogurt. But if you make it at home, it's got a lot more. Is the same true with kombucha? Like, if I buy kombucha off the shelf in a store, what do you what do you estimate its bacterial amount will be versus when I make it home? And is the stuff at home better for that reason? Well, that's an excellent point. You know, I think what it is is the definition of yogurt was limited to a couple different strains, whereas when you are making yogurt in a traditional process, your culture is more likely to have uh, several strains as opposed to two or three. With kombucha, and this is where um, I'm also – uh, president and co-founder of Kombucha Brewers International, which is the trade association representing all commercial kombucha around the world. And we're sort of, you know, at this crossroads where processed food companies, uh, you know, Pepsi bought Kavita, there's investment from Coca-Cola, you know, they're, they're starting to enter the marketplace because they see there's a great opportunity here. And so some brands aren't necessarily even fermenting kombucha. They might be using a concentrate. It might be pasteurized. They might be putting different strains of probiotics into those bottles. And that's where reading the labels is really helpful. But there is also a whole host of producers. A lot of them are small family businesses, and they are still using cultures and working with it in an authentic way. And so that's where a great test to see, as I mentioned earlier, if your product is that raw living product, 
pour a little in a glass, let it sit there. I know sacrifice, but if it grows a SCOBY, then you know that it's going to be a more robust dynamic fermentation than um, something coming from a concentrate. Now, it isn't to say that those concentrate-based products aren't good for people and don't have a value. They're certainly going to be better than a sugar-laden soda or a chemical-laden energy drink, but they may not have that same as we mentioned earlier, that same sort of diversity as you're going to find in a traditional homebrew kombucha. Yeah. Have you, have you found just anecdotally that homebrew stuff is a lot more powerful or effective than stuff in the store or uh, or is there no clear cut line? Well, because people will talk about, oh, when I bought kombucha at the store, I had one result and now I drink my homebrew and just a little bit sends me to the bathroom. So I think that um, definitely the body adjusts to different um, amounts and strengths. And when you're making it at home, you have more control over how sweet or tangy it is, which is great because you personalize it to your specific needs. You also then control how fresh it is, right? How long has it been sitting in a store? Has it been shipped uh, across a country or around the world, right? So um, that's where you get the most granular control. But of course, we can't make everything all the time. And that's where, you know, we highly recommend, yes, try the commercial brands at the grocery store. There are some really great ones there. But also go to your farmer's market. Find what's local. Make friends with your local kombucheros and um, try their products and see if that doesn't even uh, have a different profile than what you find at the grocery store. Yeah, I've seen in the store in terms of your sugar content, like – I don't know. I mean, some of them seem to be adding a lot of sugar. I've seen like, you know, an eight ounce serving uh, anywhere from like two grams of sugar to like 15 or more. Well, and this is the confusing thing. So according to FDA rules, um, all of the sugar remaining after fermentation is called added sugar. And added sugar doesn't break it down from sucrose, fructose, and glucose because often what's happening is that sucrose, which is a disaccharide and is harder for your body to process, is being split into those smaller sugars, which has a lower glycemic impact on the body. But all it says on the label is sugars. And so as the consumer, you don't know what it is you're looking at. And it's the teaspoon of sugar that helps the medicine go down. And so... I personally think that it's okay to have a slightly higher sugar grams on your kombucha because it's helping you to absorb all of those great acids. Um, We get too caught up on the numbers, and I think it's because um, there's a benefit to selling chemical sugar products that get you addicted that have no calories. And so the sugar grams are low, but they're actually not really great for your body. What about, um, you know, I'm not asking you to be a doctor or anything, but... You know, what if you have a certain condition, like you said, your husband had heartburn, or what if you have like irritable bowel syndrome or you know, whatever condition, how do you even find out if kombucha will help you besides just drinking it? And how do you find out how to modulate it so that it may work for you better? Like who, would, where would you look to even figure that out? Yeah, absolutely. There's quite a bit of research on kombucha as much as people say there aren't human trials. I mean, I would posit the human trials are human beings have been consuming it for thousands of years. And here is what they've reported it helps them with. Um, You know, we're just barely starting some sort of human trials in terms of validating for specific ailments. Uh, What we do know is we, because it's a food, right? You know, how many trials do we have on asparagus and broccoli and things like that, right? Most of the time you're eating those foods for a specific reason. They make you feel a certain way. Same with kombucha, right? We know the elements of tea. There's actually been quite a few studies done on rats that have been done in vitro. They've been done in vivo. And, um, you know, a lot of what we see out of that research is it can have, uh, um, can help lower cholesterol, can help with diabetes. And so, again, we're not making any health claims about these products, but that's what food does, right? Food provides nutrients and it helps support a healthy body. And um, you can also look at the benefits of vinegar and how that also has um, cholesterol lowering properties and things like that. So using our logical brain and reading some of this information, a lot of which is in our book, the big book of kombucha. um, And we're launching a research database with um, Kombucha Brewers International. So part of our education uh, outreach is going to be through a compilation of all of these research papers. So anyone can come type in an ailment, type in an ingredient and see what information has already been put out there about kombucha. But to your earlier point, working with a 
naturopath, working with um, doctors who sort of understand fermented foods, because sometimes people have ailments where fermented foods actually make it worse. Like there's certain types of gut dysbiosis where fermented foods, as healthy as they are and as wonderful as they are, just aren't appropriate at that stage. More healing needs to happen before you can start incorporating those into your body. So as much as we always say, get a wide variety of fermented foods in your diet. If for whatever reason you're consuming them and you don't feel good, they make you feel worse, then you want to reach out to someone who has experience with them and just sort of you know, understand, do you have a histamine allergy? Is there something else going on? Um, just to make sure that you're not exacerbating it with a quote unquote healthy food. Okay. And I looked on Amazon while we were talking to so see your book has 933 five-star reviews. So that's great. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty high for, uh, for a book in the future. So. Well, they call it the Bible. Um, and really, we poured a decade's worth of information, study, research, and love into that book to make it as accessible as possible to people. And, you know, not to toot my own horn too loudly, but we can't help but feel good that we're helping consumers get access to really great products. We're also helping um, small family businesses get off the ground and really creating a, an economic opportunity for people who don't necessarily want to be um, stuck in a corporate situation. They want to help their community. They've, you know, the story of most of these brands is they had a health challenge. Kombucha helped. And that inspired them to want to bring it to their community. And so it's really exciting mm -hmm. to see this industry grow. And a lot of people liken it to craft beer uh, 30 years ago. And now it's, you know, how do we keep this momentum growing? And to be honest, I don't even think we've hit the tipping point with kombucha, which is great because it means there's a lot of opportunity for people out there. What about the SCOBY? I've heard like people can cook them up. There's different recipes that you could eat the SCOBY and stuff. Any experience there? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Our book has some of those recipes, too. So we call it like vegan squid. Um, you want to braise it lightly because it can get too tough. But one of my favorite ways to eat the kombucha culture is as a fruit leather. So normally a fruit leather, you're going to mix a lot of fruit and sugar and then dehydrate it. Well, when you add the SCOBY to it, so SCOBY is insoluble fiber, which means your body doesn't digest it. However, just like psyllium husk, which is also insoluble fiber, it's going to come through like a broom and sweep out any excess sugars excess hormones. So now you're using half the amount of sugar because half of it's SCOBY. Um, you're dehydrating at a low temperature to maintain the probiotic benefit, and it just can be really delicious. And um, it's a wonderful way to use your extra cultures. But animals also will, like chickens will fight over SCOBY pieces, and um, you know you can also give it to plants. So again, snout to tail, there's something you can do with it. People are, are even using it to make clothing, and they're trying to create um, packaging materials out of it. So I think, again, tip of the iceberg, we don't know how far all of this kombucha and bacterial cellulose is going to go in the future. You should chop it up and sell it and call it Scoby Snacks. You know, <laughs> I know, brand, Scoby Snacks, right? Exactly you. right. <laughs> well, people will also call it Scooby as well. Yeah, that's what I mean. You know, it'd be funny if you did that. It would. Um, so if, if someone's interested in, well, I mean, do you find that people are interested in kombucha itself or it's really the health angle that, I mean, what, like, what do you hear from people and why they care about kombucha, why they're interested? Yeah. So uh, oftentimes it is from the health angle, but think about it like this. Um, kombucha is sort of a cross between a pet and a plant. No, it's not going to wiggle out of the jar and come sit on your lap. But it is alive. And um, I think people get really connected to their cultures and you know, everything is energy and has energy and microbes live in our body and on our body. And, you know, there's ways that they communicate that we don't fully understand. So I call that magic. When there's something happening that human beings haven't totally figured out yet, right, that's magic. So there, there's like a magic in the way that the microbes communicate, that they work with you. And I think that people really appreciate having that relationship with something that they feel really supports their health and makes them feel better. Um, and so whether they're buying it at the store or they're making it themselves, 
you know, you find all kinds of people and even there are brands of kombucha that highlight, you know, they're using sacred geometry or they're playing um, special uh, music or tones with it, or um, they paint the walls purple, whatever it might be. Like there really is this sort of relationship that you have with kombucha that maybe you don't have with a block of cheese or a loaf of bread, although you certainly could because both of those are fermented as well. Um, but, but people just really end up, they think of them sort of as like part of the family eventually. Well, what, what are some uses of kombucha that surprised you? Does anyone like soak their feet in it? Yes. I don't know. Does anyone, um, you know, put it in like a humidifier or a vaporizer and breathe in the vapors? Like, you know, have you heard of anything like this? I haven't heard of the vaporizing one, but definitely as a foot soak, um, you know, because the feet can release toxins and, that's sort of what kombucha does. Those acids that it creates, they bond to toxic molecules. And so then your liver secretes them through hydrolysis or going pee, right? And so it's important we drink water with kombucha because that's going to help our bodies to flush. But our body can release toxins in a lot of different ways. I mean, uh, sort of a future dream of mine is to create a kombucha spa where you can have a wide variety of treatments using a kombucha beauty products or the scobies themselves. Uh, we sell a kombucha soap that a friend of mine has been making for years and it just it leaves your skin super soft it doesn't dry it out and um yeah so i also make clay masks and um you can put a scoby on your face it won't suck out your brains i promise or maybe it already did it's too late but really what it'll do is it pulls circulation to the surface of your skin sloughs off dead skin cells but it's a gentle acid right so Vinegar is a four to eight percent acetic acid solution. Kombucha is more half a percent to one percent. So it's really mild and really great to use on the skin and can have a really um, positive benefit to, um, again, creating more uh, circulation, which brings more oxygen, which creates new skin cells. Uh, and so there's a lot of different uses for kombucha topically. Folks with eczema or um, other types of issues have also used successfully to reduce inflammation. So what's the best way or the, the way that you see works best? Or like, do you have a YouTube channel of videos? Should they just read the book? Like, what have you found is the easiest onboard to, uh, to learning about kombucha and drinking it and using it? Absolutely. Well, I would say go to our website and sign up for our free ebook. That's going to give you an email a day for five days. So it's a nice way to just sort of gently ease yourself into it. Of course, you can go crazy and read every post on the website if you like. Um, if you're not ready to buy the book, you can check it out from your library if it isn't on a hold list. Uh, but yeah, any any of those methods are going to be a great way to learn about it. Um, but definitely sign up for the ebook. And then, of course, our YouTube channel has videos. We're working on some new videos that'll come out this fall. So it's a, uh, we try to give you lots of ways to learn about kombucha and make it simple. Um, you know, we answer every email. We're a small family business, so I do all the phone orders. So if you're not sure what to order, you can call me and I can very quickly guide you to what works for you. Our, our motto is trust your gut. And so we're really about helping you to make that decision that's going to support your health. Um, and then everything's guaranteed. So you know you're working with a company that's reputable, that answers its emails, that isn't going to leave you hanging um, and and is going to... Um, and are the top experts in the world. So we also, you know, offer consultation. We have culture at wholesale, um, you know, just sort of any aspect of brewing kombucha, we do that. And then we have four cultures. So we have kombucha, we have jun, which is kombucha's raw honey cousin. We also do water kefir and milk kefir, and these are all in living form. Okay, do you, do you ever do any live events or uh, meetups or conferences or anything where people can see you in person and do live demos? Absolutely. So um, I speak at the Mother Earth News Fairs. The next one, next one's coming up in Pennsylvania at Seven Springs this September. Um, and then I travel all over the world. So our book is coming out in Spanish. I'll be in Spain in October to do some book events in Barcelona. Um, and then with the Trade Association, I'm also, we're going to Berlin, doing a kombucha summit there, a members meeting. Um, and yes, I travel quite a bit throughout the year to a variety of different health conferences. And you can find those events listed on our website. Okay. That's great. Well, Hannah, I really appreciate you coming and uh, you're doing good things. So thank you for being on the podcast. Oh, thank you, Richard. I appreciate the opportunity to connect with you and your guests. You're listening to the future tech health podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. 
Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.